Sì, sono su che. Ok, so, okay. okay so let me repeat myself. Good afternoon again. I am Olado Tunike, the editor for NSC414 Medical Sociology. Uh, during our um, online facilitation, we studied, we went through study session 1 to 12. So this afternoon, we'll try as much, I will try as much as possible to revise study session 1 to 12 with us. So we'll try and um, do it short, briefly, so that we'll be able to cover all the aspects of the course that was, being, that was done during uh, phase 2 um, online facilitation. So NSC414 is a medical sociology. So this afternoon we'll start with introduction to sociology. sociology. The word sociology is derived from the Latin word social, which means society, and Greek word logos, which means science, scientific study. So in other words, you want to put that word together, you say sociology is the scientific study of the society. Sociology is the scientific study scientific study of society and there is no society there is no sociology without the society and that will lead us to the definition of our society which is the largest group of people inhabiting a specific territory group of people that are living together interacting with one another depending on each other within a geographical um, territory and in this we we'll realize that social inter interaction is quite important when we are discussing sociology and social interaction is just how people relate to one another and influence one another. And I said it earlier on that sociology is a scientific study. So the word scientific has made sociology a process because it starts to go through different processes to become what it is today. So in other words, you can define sociology as a systematic approach to study women's relations and the products of such relationships. So we'll be moving to why, would, why do we really need to study a society? Why do we need to study our society? Why the need for society, uh, sociology? We discover that even before now, women, human beings have been trying to survive on their own, but it has not really worked. So people have to depend on each other to be able to survive. And that's the first reason why we need to so study the society. The second one is because human survival can only be accomplished if human beings act collectively. And I said it earlier on that sociology has to do with relationship dependency on one another. It has to do with social interaction between uh, one, uh, human beings. So what are the goals of sociology? What are the goals of sociology? What does sociologists really want to achieve? One is because one is the discovery of facts. This discovery of facts. The other one is explanation of fact and the third one is explanation of causes of human behavior while the last one is ultimate prediction of behavior and you will see that through, through these um, goals of to discover that sociology has to go through the scientific method of finding facts and knowing the causes of human behavior why we react why we behave the way we behave and moving on we'll look at the relationship between society, nature, and individuals. Relationship between society, nature, and individual. When you look at the relationship between individual and society, they there is no society without the people living therein. And that's why we said man is a social animal. Man, man wants to relate, man wants to interact, man wants to depend on the other. The other one is that a man cannot live as a man cannot live as a man without a society. You can't live without a society. And you can see that even in our place of work, we, in our places of work, we have one friend or the other that we are relating with. And that's what makes a society. And society is not, the third one is the fact that society not only control our movement, but also shape our identity, our thoughts, and our emotions. Society not only control our movement, but it shapes our identity, our thoughts, our, and our emotions. We can see it in, we, uh, nurses, because we belong to the society of nurses, there is a way we, 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 we have, there is a way we dress, and this shows that the society, the nursing society has shaped our, our, our thoughts, our identity. And another thing we want to look at is the relationship between society and nature. 
society and nature. We will discover that in a society, we depend on nature to survive. We harness nature and control the forces of nature in many ways. And in the one way in which we depend on nature is through our farm products, farming, mining. We can keep naming those things we do on nature. And in return, human activity also is harming nature. And that's why there should be a balance in the ecosystem. So moving on now, we we'll look at the reality of society, the reality of society. Society does not exist without individuals. I think I've been reinforcing that aspect. There is no society without individuals. Society was humanly created. And if you have to go through history, we'll discover that it is, it is a group of people that will come together to create, to make a town or to create a society. Another one is society and person then are interdependent, both society and the human beings living near him. They are interdependent. There is no human being without a society, and there is no society without the people living there. Then the third point there is that it is human effort, collective, and organized as society changes. It is a human effort, collective effort, and organized effort that society changes. Those are the reality of society. Those are the reality that we can see um, in society. So we're moving on to sociology and human society. And as we have um, divided it earlier on that sociology of society, there is no sociology without the, so uh, the society. So we want to look at how this society came to be initially. We'll be looking at the classification of um, society by social organization. And we have four classifications. The first one is the unseen and gathering society. The second one is the horticultural society. The third one is the agrarian society. And the fourth one is the pre-industrial and industrial society. We could see that it developed gradually. It didn't just start in a day. So the hunting and gathering society is a small society, the earliest form of society to develop. It's a small society and is a small nomadic um, population with uncomplicated technology. In fact, majorly during this period, they are all about getting what they will need. It's just meeting their family needs alone. It's not a big time, uh, a big time uh, society. It's just a small society living together to survive. So the second one is the horticultural society. And in this horticultural society is the one after the hunting and gathering, they are developing tools in this horticultural um, society. Domestic material first appear and tools were sophistic more sophisticated. It's not as if it is a modern tool, but at least they have tools for their family, they have tools to farm, they have tools for hunting, and they, they have uh, uh, tools to gather um, uh, food. So that's the horticultural um, society. The third one is the agrarian society. And this one came into being after the horticultural society. You know, we said during the horticultural society, they are developing tools. And plow, they develop a plow which can be used on the farm. And this is, and after this, another characteristic of that society is the fact that they develop the initial stage of the money economy, gunpowder, high on melting. So it is during this agrarian society that money exchange starts. They, are start, they started using money to buy things. It is during the agrarian society. And the last one is the pre-industrial and industrial society, which we can say we are here in present day, the modern world that we have. The pre-industrial society they are characterized by fishing and herding society. Why the industrial society? They are characterized by urbanization, massive mechanization, and automation. We can see that in Lagos. You will see that you can really say that Lagos is an industrial society which has developed, has gone through stages to become what it is today. So that's the um, uh, classification of the society that we have. So moving on to the specific of sociological study of society. The sociological view of the society, how, so, uh, how um, and this uh, society is being viewed by people. One, the number one thing is that sociology is morally neutral. And this is applicable to witnesses especially. 
we must be morally neutral in administering our care to our patients. Another word for that is that we must be liberal. It's not as if we should be a Christian us, and though we are Christian, we know that that's our belief, but we should not try to impose it on our patient that is a Muslim. So sociology, as a, sociology teaches us to be morally neutral. Another thing is that emphasis is not placed on individual. Emphasis is placed on people. Emphasis is placed on group. Emphasis is placed on interrelationship between people. Another point there is that relationship between people, group of people, and social institutions do change periodically. It's not as if it is static. It changes. It is dynamic. The relationship between people changes periodically. And the last one there is that sociology, sociology is scientific. Sociology is scientific. And we have said it that it includes discovery, it includes planning, it includes gathering of data. So sociology is scientific. So moving on, I want to quickly look at the origin and development of sociology. The origin and development of sociology. Well, we have been looking at, at this point because it's uh, development of sociology went through different uh, processes. And we have said it that it started from just few people, thousands of people coming together before they become a, a, a big community that has mechanized um, uh, operation now, mechanized, uh, mechanized automation and the rest. So what are the factors that can influence the expansion of soci sociology? Factors that can influence the expansion of sociology. And three factors are mentioned here. One is overpopulation. Another one is poverty. And the third one is crime. And we are also moving on to the subject matter of sociology, subject matter of sociology. In order to have a clear perspective of the subject matter of sociology, sociology adopted different methods. So for us to be able to understand this, um, uh, uh, the subject matter of sociology, sociology has to adopt three approaches, different approaches, so that we we'll have proper understanding of the concept sociology. And as we know that the so, that sociology is a rich scientific tradition by which the ever-changing society, that is human interaction, can be appropriately conceptualized. So we'll look at it briefly. The three approaches that, were, that, was, that we have that helps in the understanding of the subject matter is one, the historical approach, the empirical approach, and the analytical approach. The, the historical approach offers us the opportunity to benefit from the past. And looking at the word historical, we we'll, we'll realize that it has to do with the past, the beginning, the origin of, the, of, of sociology itself. So understanding this, this uh, path will help us to benefit from the wisdom, wisdom of the past so that we'll be able to make uh, necessary improvements on the future. However, it runs the risk of making our thinking rigid. If we have to stick to the past, definitely we will not progress. So that's the disadvantage of this approach. The second approach is the historic, uh, is the empirical approach. The empirical approach. This approach gives us the opportunity to. This approach is the least ambiguous because it has to do with the scientific method. Now, the, in, during the historical um, approach, there are data that are scattered. But during the empirical approach, all these data are put together. It, it, uh, it, it, it gives us the opportunity, the opportunity of counting those data and having them in a compacted form instead of having them in a, a scattered uh, form. So this empirical approach is more is least ambiguous. It makes work more easier than the other approaches um, of sociology. And uh, the third one is the analytical approach. The third one is the analytical approach. It's the least troublesome method of um, of understanding the subject matter of sociology. And this is a time-honored path followed continuously since it was first marked by Auguste Comte. It's worthy to know that it, this analytical approach was first 
used by Auguste, or Auguste de Conte, the father of sociology, for the decree divining the subject matter of human learning as none of the force of law. So this approach is beautiful, but as a poor guide to what is really happening. It is beautiful, but it has a poor guide to what is really happening. So moving on to the founding fathers of sociology, I will encourage you to read up on, on the general outline of the subject matter of sociology. Please kindly read it up because you know you have objective questions to answer and you may have some there. So please read up that part. So we are look, moving on to the founding fathers of sociology. Several persons, by their great contribution, the origin and develop of social, development of sociology became its founding fathers. We have several ones that, have, that are the founding fathers of this subject matter sociology, but we may not be able to discuss them, but we'll quickly go through a few of them and talk about their contribution briefly. The first one we want to talk about is Auguste Comte and positivism. He lived between 1917-98 and 1857. He was known as the founding father of sociology, especially the modern sociology. And Comte wanted sociology to be a positive science, that is a scientific science, a scientific um, um, course, that's, that's his desire. So Conte, to Conte, however, applying the scientific method to social life mean, meant practicing what might be called armchair philosophy, drawing conclusions from informal observation of social life. So that is the method. He believes in using scientific method in the subject matter of uh, sociology. And the implication of that is that he will be drawing conclusions from informal observation of social life. Another uh, father that we want to look at is Abbas Spencer. Abbas Spencer lived between 1820 and 1903. Uh, he's, he's, he, in fact, he was known as the second founding father of sociology, and his main focus was on the evolutionary growth of social structures, evolutionary growth of social structures. He believed that uh, the, 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 in, in a social structure, you have the people that have the, the highest level of survival and the lowest level of survival, and those that, give, that have the highest level of survival who produce a good seed, that is his belief. So he coined the term survival of the fittest. He coined the term survival of the fittest. Spencer was convinced that society evolved from the lower barbarian to, the, to higher civilized. Another founding father we still want to look at is Karl Marx and class conflict. Karl Marx and class conflict. Conflict. She lived, he lived between 1818 and 1883, 1880 and 1883. He believed that the engine of human history is class conflict, and that's the major aspect he based his own work on as a sociologist. Another person we want to look at is Max Weber and the Protestant ethnic. Max Weber and the Protestant ethnic. Weber disagree with Marx's claim that economics is the central force in social change. His work is majorly based on social change, but Marx, Karl Marx believed that economics is the central force. His economics is the only thing that can bring a change in the society. But for Weber, his own belief is that religion has a major part to play when you want a social change. The religion has a, a, a high a, a, a very important part to play in the society. So moving on now, we'll look another, at another founding father, Emily Dawkins. Emily Dawkins. She, she lived between uh, she lived between 1858 and 1917. 1858 and 1917. Uh, his major contributions include division of labor in society. Elementary forms of religious belief, uh, suicide rules of sociological method. And Talcott, another one is Talcott, Fastings and Sea Ride Mules. They live between 1902 and 1982. Fasting is a leading American sociologist. He views sociology as the analysis of social relationships and cultural products. So that's Fasting's uh, major contribution. He sees sociology as 
a social relationship and cultural product. Why write this sociology, we hold this sociology to be more involved in social, because that's their major contribution to sociology. So we'll be looking at perspectives of sociology, perspectives of sociology. Now, sociology perspective is the lens that an individual chooses to view this of society. It's how you choose to see the society. That's what you call sociological perspective. Another word is sociological view. The way you choose to see the society. That's the sociological perspective. It helps to understand human behavior of life by placing it within its broader social context. Sociological perspective helps us to understand human behavior by placing it within its broad social context. What are the characteristics of sociological perspective? One is that it tells us to see the general in the particular. It tells us to see the general in the particular. And the, the implication of it is it, 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 it prevents us from generalization. Just like we will see a single person and we will use that person to justify, to, 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 to say, okay, this is how everybody behaves. No. But rather, we will see the general in particular. The second one is seeing the strange in the familiar seeing the strange in familiar. The third one is seeing individual in social context. Seeing individual in social context. What are the benefits of sociological perspective? What are the benefits of sociological perspective? One is that it empowers us to be active member of our society. Now, once we know that, who will, they will see us as representative of our society. Definitely we want to be active member of that society. The number two is that it helps us to live in a culturally diverse world. It helps us to live in a culturally diverse world. Another thing is that it helps us to see the opportunities and constraints in our lives. And the third one, the fourth one is that it helps us to okay, it helps us to live in a cultural. Sorry about that for the repetition. So moving on, we'll discuss the discipline of sociology. The discipline of sociology. Now some sociologists, in fact, there was uh, an argument that sociology cannot be classified as a scientific study. Some believe it's a natural science, uh, while others believe it's a social science. Well, um, the, the sociologists, the, the founding fathers of sociology, try as much as possible to put sociology under social sciences. So we'll quickly look at the definition of this concept. One, what is science itself? Science is the application of system is uh, is the, the application of systematic method to obtain knowledge and the knowledge obtained by those methods. So when you use systematic method to obtain knowledge, that's science, and that's what we said sociology does. We remember we said the goals of sociology is to discover facts. It goes through processes. So we can say now that sociology is a science, a scientific uh, course. Another one is that. Uh, another concept we want to look at is natural sciences, the intellectual and academic discipline designed to explain and predict events in our natural environment. So some of, uh, uh, proponents of this um, view says, okay, we can put sociology in uh, under natural sciences, but the founding father disagree with this uh, view. So let's quickly look at the definition of uh, social sciences. It's an intellectual and academic discipline designed to understand the world, the social world, objectively by means of control and, re and repeated observation. And that's what sociology does. It, 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 it observes what is happening in the society by means of control and repeated um, observation. So we'll be moving on now to level of analysis in sociology level of analysis in sociology. There are three levels of analysis in sociology. And these three levels are the interpersonal level, the group level, and the societal level. That's the three ways in which you can analyze um, sociology, three ways in which you can analyze um, uh, sociology. The first one is the interpersonal level. The interpersonal level is the social connection between two or more persons, such as friend, friends, leader follower neighbor neighbor is just an interaction between just two or more person is not more than that is not a group it's not a large community so you can see that relationship between a friend and a friend 
a leader and a follower, a neighbor and a neighbor. And the second one is the group level. It deals with groups and group relations. Groups and group relations. And you agree with me that this group level will be a large number, just like um, nursing students, further level nursing students of Laotse. That's a group of students. So it's a large number of people, such as group of friends and university. What are the societal level? Deals with the whole community, all the society, the whole community, all the society when you talk about the unemployment uh, unemployed uh, unemployed youth in nigeria you will know that it is a large uh, community we can say open short community is a large community so that's the example of societal level of uh, analysis in sociology so quickly we'll look at social interaction and processes social interaction and processes now social interaction is the foundation of society. Social interaction is the foundation of society. Without interaction, there is no society. And that's why this course is very important because it will help us in interacting with our patients. It will help us in interacting with our colleagues at work. It will help us in interacting with our seniors at work because we will know that we are part of that society and there's nothing like it is just I alone in the society. It has to do with two or more people that are working together. So without interaction, there will be no life. Without interaction, there will be no life. And we all agree with me that one of the nursing roles is to interact well with our clients because it goes a long way in helping the client to recover from whatever ailment they came to the hospital with. But if a nurse is hostile to ease our patient, then definitely the, 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 the patient will not find that environment conducive for, for recovery or for healing. So that's why it is important as nurses to have a good understanding of this uh, course and this concept of social interaction. And so there are few fundamental forms. There are few fundamental forms of interactions of individual and group. There are few fundamental, fundamental form of interaction of individual and groups. And these um, fundamental forms are, we have opposition, cooperation, and adjustment. Opposition, cooperation, and adjustment. Opposition, okay, opposition, is the dissociated form of social interaction. Opposition is the dissociated, dissociated form of interaction. It includes, you know, we have two types in our course guide, which is uh, opposition in form of a uh, competition and opposition in form of conflict. When we talk about opposition in form of uh, competition, we are saying that it's a process in which individuals or groups try against each other for the use or ownership of limited goods when they compete with each other, when they fight against each other. It's just like um, uh, uh, when there is a reward to take, maybe running. In fact, that one is even unhealthy competition. But when, when you see that there is a conflict between two people because of a reward, because of a position, then that's uh, what we call opposition in form of um, competition. And this uh, op competition could be absolute. It could be relative. It could be absolute or relative. But talking about, in fact, it, it could be pure. It could be unrestricted. It could be limited. There are different forms of this type of uh, opposition. So let's quickly look at co cooperation. Cooperation is a process or a situation in which individual or group work together to perform a task to reach a commonly valued goal. Now, this is another, this is like a synonym of a cooperation. You know, that antonym of a cooperation is opposition. So when people, when group of people work together to achieve a particular goal, a valued goal together in collaboration with one another, then you say they are cooperative, they is cooperation. And there are different types, there are different forms of this uh, cooperation. We have the primary cooperation, the secondary cooperation, the consensus cooperation, antagonistic cooperation, and cohesive 
cooperation. When you talk about the primary cooperation, it prevails in small groups such as families and ethnic groups. Mere little room is left for distinction between group life and individual. So the primary one is just between two or more, uh, or between families, or called between families, when they cooperate together to achieve a common objective. While the secondary cooperation, secondary groups such as modern industrial organization are mainly based on bureaucracies, rational formal specialized processes, or secondary cooperation. So the secondary one include it has to do with a group. It's more than just the family. It encompasses a large number of people. While the antagonist cooperation, if the one has to do with um, it is even larger. It, 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 it represents a precarious working relationship which is overshadowed by latent, a, a conflict that is not showing before. That's what you call the um, antagonist cooperation. So moving on now, we'll look at adjustment. Adjustment, this adjustment is just trying to accommodate, trying to assimilate uh, a person. So adjustment could exist as accommodation or as assimilation. Could exist as accommodation or as assimilation. Now, accommodation, this leads to hostile individual and groups, to reduction, elimination of conflict through reciprocal alteration of behavior. So when you try to, um, to, 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 to change your behavior, to accommodate others, that's what you call accommodation. And there are different forms, if, which I didn't list here, but it's in our course guide, we'll see coercion, we'll see uh, compromise, toleration, different arbitration, different form of uh, accommodation. Likewise, assimilation. Assimilation is when we accept another um, culture, when we accept another belief into our own belief. So assimilation of, it could be of weaker group into a stronger one. It could be marginal of different groups together. Assimilation could be in any of these um, two forms. So moving on, I want to quickly look at the main distance of zones that are commonly used. The main distance of zones that are commonly used in social interaction. So these main zones, we have four of them. We have four of them. We have the intimate distance, we have the personal distance, we have the social distance, and we also have the we have the public distance. And I know the one we are all familiar with presently during this corona um, pandemic issue is the, the social distancing, which everybody can easily say often the social distancing is not very common. So it's just under social interaction. And, and I, I, I want to try and bring this course to our understanding that is, is something that is applicable to our daily life. So the intimate distance is just for friends, for family, just a small space that is very close to individual body for, 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 is for love making, for comforting like partner. <laughs> That's what you call intimate distance. What the personal distance is just like eight, four feet. 18 inches to four feet is represented for friends, for acquaintances, for ordinary conversation, maybe in the office. So that's what you call the personal distance. But the social distance is about four to 12 feet, four to 12 feet. And that's what they are asking us to abide with or abide by during this present uh, crisis that the whole world is in. This, this, this social distance uh, is for job interviews where you have your, your interviewer and the interview sitting opposite each other in a far distance, while the public distance is beyond, it extends beyond 12 uh, feet, it extends beyond 12 feet. So we'll quickly discuss um, social movements, social movements. Social movements are made up of individuals who are dissatisfied with part or all of an existing type of social organization. There are individuals who are not happy with what is happening with their organi in, the, in their organization. Now, it is worthy to know that this set of people are part of that organization before they become dissatisfied with whatsoever is happening in that organization. And we can see social movements across the world presently. You will see it in the Middle Belt, uh, the Syrian protesting. Yes, that's the, that's the characteristic, they, they protest against whatsoever is happening. 
the people protesting against the politicians, those are social media, and you can see it even in, in our world. Let me bring it home. In our uh, various worlds, our places of work, we can protest against maybe a policy that was just raised by the organization and tell them we are not satisfied with it. So that's what we call social movement. So we have four types of social movement, four types of social movement. The first one is the general social movement. The second one is the specific social movement. The third one is expressive movement. And the fourth one is revival and nationalistic movement. The general social movement is, it reflects new self images that individuals formulate against the background of gradual and general cultural drift. So the general social movement includes feminism, the youth development, and labor movement that we have. But the specific social movement, they, they are under growth of the first type. They, 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 they come, they are, they are, when you have general, out of that general, you now still have some people coming out of it, forming another group. They are the uh, specific uh, social movement. They are the undergrowth of the first one. Why the expressive movement? They are represented by religious and fashion movement. They do not function as agents of change, but they are, they are also a type of movement. And the last one is the revival and nationalistic movement. And that's all you can see in these um, uh, middle belt countries I, 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 I mentioned just now. The different protests going on in the nation, a revival in the nation. That's the, um, the revival and nationalistic movement. And this social movement goes through stages. It's not as if people will just rise up a day and they start protesting. A lot of things would have gone underneath. And that's why we'll be looking at the four stages of social movement. The first one is social unrest. That's stage one, which is social unrest. <clears throat> and the second one is popular excitement, which is the second uh, phase, popular excitement. The third phase is formalized organization. And stage four is institution, institutionalization, institutionalization, institutionalization. So the social unrest, which is the first one, that one is action oriented. It's action oriented. The, the, the is a combination of destructive feeling and attitude such as dissatisfaction. People are just angry, insecurity, hostility, and frustration. That's what brings them together in the first instance. So after the initial burst of mass. Uh, discontent in the form of undirected sporadic and frustrated demonstration. They are usually they usually appear as the agitator. So that's the um, social unrest. The second the second one, which is the popular excitement phase, uh, the, the, is, 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 it follows the first uh, phase. Uh, there is a deep sense of solidarity and ideal uh, solidarity among these people that. That, that are fighting their leaders. So they will come together, they will have a leader among themselves, and there will be a solidarity, and they will have an idea that all of them are following. That's the second phase. Then the third one is formalized organization. After they have selected a person to lead their group, then they will form it, they will, they will form an organization that will have tactics, that will have discipline, that will have rules and policies which is paramount to the establishment of that organization. The movement will pass from the hands of a leader who stands from it, the temple that of a statesman. It will, it, will, it will be in the hand of that kind of person that will be able to control the group. And the last phase of social movement is institutionalization. And a lot of, um, a lot of um, organizations have developed through the spaces. A lot of organizations have developed and come out from social movement. So the last part of this is um, in, in the, uh, institution, institution, institutionalization. So we'll be moving on now to collective. Um, sorry. We'll be moving on now to collective behavior. Please forget about the four types of crap because we'll later check, we'll work on it again. So collective behavior. Collective behavior may be defined as the relatively unorganized pattern of social interaction in human groups. Collective behavior, you can define it as 
unorganized pattern of social interaction in human groups. Uh, the example I can easily give is uh, in the normal classes, when you have a normal 400 level class, you expect them to be seated, to listen to their lecturer, to write notes, that's the normal thing. But paraventure during the lecture, there is a fire outbreak. You see that the student will be rotting in etta scatter, they want to get out of the class, and that's what you want to you call collective behavior. That's when you will see this term being used. You see then that everybody just want to ensure that ensure their safety. So this collective behavior has um, many types, has many forms. One of it is public. We have crowd. We have masses, rumors, uh, public opinion, and propaganda. These are collective um, behavior. Crowd is number one. The crowd. Crowd is fueled as highly emotional, uncritical, and often automatic. It's just like the example I just cited. When people just maybe because of the alarm, the fire alarm or the, the fire outbreak, maybe in the hall, and people are just trying to escape. You see that their action is highly emotional. It's uncritical. It's often automatic. They are not just thinking about it. They just want to ensure they are their safety. So there are different types of crowd. We have the casual crowd, the conventionalized crowd, the acting crowd, and the expressive or dancing crowd. Now, the casual crowd represents the momentary assemblage of individuals who watch a performer in the, in the maybe in the cinema. So just assembly of people. That's the casual crowd. But when you talk about the confessionalized crowd, there are people listening to concert or observing a football game. But the acting crowd, the aggressive crowd, the acting crowd are the aggressive crowd, while the expressive crowd, they are often the they often provide the basis for development of religious sects or the careers of all teenage idols. So this expressive crowd, they are the one expressing their action so that's the crowd so i also mentioned in uh, that we also have public we also have public there are modern societies that are developed that has many they, these are the ones that we call public they are grouped with special interest but different opinion publics are grouped with special interest of of but with different um, opinions they have their own opinion those are the ones we call public so moving on to social organization now. Social organization. Social organization is defined as arrangements of people, groups, and members. In fact, arrangements of families, giving them different or specific tasks. <laughs> when the arrangements of present groups and members, and they have specific tasks according to their status, their role. When the social organization has to do with organizing people, groups, members, and having a specific task depending on their status and role. And some concepts of this social organization, they are their strife status, the achieve, achieve status, the role expectation, role, role strain, role conflict. When you talk about a strife status, a strife status is in bone status. An example of it is what you see in uh, gender, Race. We are bound. That's that's just uh, is natural. It's natural. It's innate. That's ascribed status. But achieve status is an end status. It's, it's what you earn. What you work for. They are those that result from our action. An example of it is a professor. He was not just given the, the title professor. He's not an honorary professor, but he worked for it. Example of it is you as a nurse. You work for your certificate. You were not just given. That certificate. So that's an achieved status. But another one is role expectation. Role expectation is the basis of actual content of your role, of your role behavior. What we have been saying that, okay, you, everybody will have a specific role, but role expectation is what you are even expected to do as a person. When you are given the status, when you have whether achieved or ascribed status, what the expectation 
from that status is what you call role expectation. So role strain is a situation in which contradictory expectations are built into a single role, in which contradictory contradictory expectations are built into a single role. It's just like performing the role of a mother, a nurse, a student. Definitely, there could be a role strain at one time or the other when you have so many roles in a single role of the mother. So role conflict, a situation in which two or more people role contra have contradictory requirements. A situation in which two or more of a person's role have contradictory requirements. So by this, we have come to the end of today's lecture. Thank you for your time. I will welcome questions and contributions. Thank you. Thank you, our facilitator. Please, if you have any question, kindly raise your hand so that we can recognize you. Please identify yourself if you have any question. Okay. I can see techno comments. So you can ask your question now. Hello. Good afternoon, ma. Good afternoon. Go ahead. Ask your question. For Emily Dokken, his year of birth was between 1858 to 1977, while in his discovery of a research on a suicide rate, I saw there 1897 to 1966. The dates are confusing, ma'am. Pass the data over to you. Okay, so is that in your manual, please? Yes, yes, ma. Page 41. Of your manual. Yes, ma. Okay. The first one is the right one, please. Uh, no, they said comparing the suicide rate of several European countries. So the date yes. that was given is. 1897 to 1966, but I think by that time it should have been gone out of the earth. I think there is a mistake with that date. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Just saying because of the OBJ questions. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Adetunji Motorayo, your question. Please ask your question, Aditunji Motorayo. Yeah, your question now. You can ask your question. Techno P904. Question. Why are you raising your hands since you know you don't have question? I don't you do. Then down, your question. Father Yibaliki is your question. Good afternoon, Ma. Yeah, good afternoon. Please, ma, I want you to explain the social, the, the distancing again. Like, it's not in our manner at all. And I, my next social talk distance was... Is your, social distance is in your manner. I said it earlier on that we have uh, four distance or tones, tones. And the first one is the, you have the personal distance, you have the intimate distance, 
the personal distance, the social distance, and the public distance. And I said the intimate distance is just the distance between your body and it's meant for hugging, for kissing, just with your partner. Why the personal distance can accommodate your friends? The personal distance can accommodate your friends. Well, but when you talk about social distance, it goes beyond 14, uh, 4 feet to um, 12. It goes beyond 4 feet to 12 feet. That's um, the personal distance. And I said that's what you see between the interview and the interview, interviewer and the, uh, the person being interviewed. The, the distance between them is just like somebody sitting across the chair while the interviewer is sitting if they little distance away from from those that are interviewing him or her so that's the personal and i said that's what we are experiencing presently that the government is asking us to stay away to give gaps between us and the person we are standing beside i'm trying to bring the knowledge of sociology to, pre to what is happening presently all over the world, not just in Nigeria, no. and that's what we call personal distance. While the public distance is more than 12 feet, but the distance we are uh, experiencing presently is not up to 12, it's not, up to, it's not even up to 12 feet, it's between 4 and uh, 12 feet. So that's, that's the explanation of that part, and it's in your manner, please. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Mr. James, please, do I have you on the... Hello. Hello? Hello, sir. Am I, am I on? You are on. Ask your question. Be done. Okay. The, my question is that under social movement, Assuming we are having a kind of social movement in health sector and is involving nurses or the general health workers, the doctors, pharmacists, and the, and, the, and the like, what is the role of a nurse or what is, what is it that is expected of us, both in terms of clinical, when, when it's going to affect a, a patient, but for example, uh, when Nam is saying, okay, we are, we are going on strike and uh, it's going to affect our patients and at the same time, we need to join the action movement. What uh, is your expected role of the Nam? Hello? Yeah, offer to you, man. Okay. Now, you in the policies of your organization, the role you play will determine the policy of your organization. Now, if you have signed a document of no strike before you enter an organization and you want to be involved in a social movement, definitely if your employment is terminated, they don't have a force. So you must understand the rules and regulations of your organization very well before you join a social movement. And I, be that may, I have to say that when you talk about social movement, it's not an individual movement. It has to be a group 
So just like the whole nurses in Nigeria fighting for their rights from federal government, the labor rules give us that opportunity to do that. And it's not as if they will go on strike in a day. They would have been on it. Different negotiations would have been going on. So it is when they realize that the government is not yielding to their desire, that's when they will now decide on whether they should go on a strike and action. So your role will determine one on the policies of, of, of your organization, then two, it will determine, it will depend on the social group itself. You can't just call a strike or any negative um, 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 effort against your organization as when it's just one group that is not recognized. So if it is a recognized group under law, then social movement is um, you can you can take part in it. And for nurses, there is nothing stopping us from fighting for our rights as nurses. But it must be, as I said earlier on, that there are rules to it. There are ways you have to go by it. There are international labor uh, organization rules and the rest like that. So those, those are the things you would look at before you embark on any social movement. Thank you. Richard. Thank you, sir. Please, ma'am, my question is, how can we differentiate the horticultural society and that of um, industrialization? That is under classification of society by social organization, ma'am. Okay, now the horticultural society is the one immediately after the first society, which is hunting and gardening. Now, the agricultural yes, society yes, is just a bit developed from hunting and gathering. They are just developing their tools. It's just like having um, um, oars for farming, plow. It's not as if you have a mechanized tools like tractor and the rest. You understand oh. what I'm saying? So, what I'm saying in essence is agricultural society is not a developed society. It's just coming up. In fact, their number is not a large um, society. It's just like one village that is just developing, that developed from being a settlement that has grown to a village or a town, and they have developed basic tools for survival. And that horticultural society, they are also into farming. So this, uh, just farming to meet the needs of their family. That is horticultural society. Why you talk about the pre Industrial and the industrial society is a well developed society using mechanized uh, tools for farming automation and the rest like that. And I cited the example, it's just like you say, you saying uh, one village, maybe let's use one name, maybe one, um, uh, one, uh, I don't know the name to give to the village, and you are comparing it to Lagos. That is far, far more developed than a village. Thank you. Oluwa Adam Lola. your question, please. Oluwa Adam Lola. Huawei, your question. Hello, you have the floor. Uh, Madam, do you have anything to say to them so that you can call it a day? Okay, thank you, Mr. James. Thank you for the um, assistance and um, always being there for us. So all I have to say is, please read it, read in between the in, read in between the lines, and don't just leave a portion of your book because I will, I will, I will tell you that the your question is set from study session one to two of in between the lines please try as much as possible to read and digest it i can't give you um aoc because the the, the questions is all rant is all rant so please and please read and read well god will help you it doesn't extend beyond study session 12 that was treated today so thank you and when i wish you best of luck
Kita aja yang semua di depan ya. Thank you. Thank you.